The accuracy will also roughly increase from there here to there in the same way that the, time, the, the, the computational time is going to increase. And you have to find for every case what you can afford in terms of computational cost and the quality that you need to, 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 to solve our problems. You see in this case of adenine that I mentioned before, I told you that if I, if I run my dynamics with MERCI like I did before, I get my conic test sections at C2 conic uh, C2 deformations. In this map here, that's a map of the creme popo parameters that give the kind of puckering that you have in a molecule in a six member ring. Uh, this region here is a region of C2 deformation. This region here, for instance, is a region of C6 deformation. Compare the simulation done with ab initio methods with the simulation done with a semi empirical method. They are completely different. The ab initio is telling that the C2 conic test section, that this one here, is the most used, while the same empirical is telling that the C6, that one there, is the most used. What's curious about these two simulations are that both of them gives roughly the, roughly the same lifetime, which means that one of them is giving the right result for the wrong reason. And if you go to TDDFT, you see that TDDFT is predicting C2 deformation, either use PB0 or BHLIP. But TDDFT is giving a quite a wrong result for the degree of puckering. This coordinate here indicates how much puckering I have in the molecule. Uh, zero indicates that the molecule is completely planar. 0.5 indicates that the molecule is really out of plane, and to get to a conic test section, I need to have something like 0.5 angstrom of puckering. TDDFT with both functionals are really far away from that. In fact, if you, if you map that, and you did this carefully in this paper, and look at the internal conversion of adenine with several different methods, ADC2, that's a, a, a kind of a cousin of a coupled plus method, MURCI single ab initio, MURCI semi-empirical, and several flavors of TDDFT. What you see here is the following. First, TDDFT is simply wrong. TDDFT, wherever functional that you tested, since PBE to uh, M06HF is always underestimating the reactivation, predicting that the lifetime of adenine is too long. So TDDFT has not been able so far with all the functionals to predict the ultra-fast deactivation of adenine. On the other hand, ADC2, MRCI ab initio, and MRCI semi empirical they can predict the, 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 the ultra-fast deactivation of adenine, but as you see here by the from the colors, they predict with different, uh, for different reasons. The blue bar indicates the amount of C2 deactivation. The green indicates the C6 deactivation, and the uh, orange indicates the amount of hydrogen elimination. And you see that if I use ab initio MRCI, I have mostly C2 convert, internal conversion, with uh, semi empirical I have C6, and with ADC2 I have almost half-half with a, some, some bigger trend towards C2. The problem here is that to go either to C2 or C6 depends upon to overcome ver, uh, two barriers either barrier that goes to the conic section of C6 or a barrier that goes to the conic section of C2. If you compute the reaction pathway from the excited state minimum to either conic section, you see that every method, you give a different relation between the barriers. And 
the result is dramatically dependent on the balance between the height of the barrier going to C6 and the barrier going to C2. For instance, MURCI ab initio has a lower barrier to go to C2, and that explains why from here I usually get C2 connector sections. OM2 has a smaller barrier going to C6, and that explains why in, with OM2 we tend to go to C6 connector sections. What's the right answer? If you look at the best results that you have here, that's the cache PT2, you see that PT2 has a trend towards C2. So it means that to have more C2 is probably the right answer. This is a problem that doesn't aff affect only adenine. It's a general problem for excited state calculations. Look at this a dimer. That's a model for heterojection used use for uh, organic photovoltaics. You have a sex thiophene. It's an oligomer with six units of thiophene together with a fullerene. After excitation, you, have a, you are supposed to have an electron transfer from the thiophene to the fullerene. And if you compute the vertical electronic spectrum of this complex with several functionals using time-dependent DFT, what you see is that you basically have whatever result you want. With a hybrid functional like b lip that's the most used functional, you get the charge transfer states that are red states. You see here, the red states are the charge transfer from the donor to the acceptor. It's the lowest state. That's the same with PB0. But nothing like this happens to any of the other functionals. Indeed, we know that uh, this feature of overstabilization of, of, the, of the charge transfer by hybrid and pure functionals without long range corrections is really an uh, uh, artifact of TDDFT approach. So the, the right result should be one of those. But even when I include the range separation correction, I still have quite a spread of results. And even if you use the same functional like LCBLIP, but to change the, the, the range separation uh, parameter, you can have rather different results. So it's a quite dramatic problem that puts us in a very uh, a disturbing situation. The ground state simulations in computation, uh, the ground state simulations, they are excellent nowadays. I could say you can, you can really tell that experimentalists and theoreticians are really talking in the same level. You can make uh, simulations with one or two KKR per mole of accuracy if you really do the, the right job. They are excellent. But as soon as you go to the excited state, the accuracy is something like 5 or 10 KKR per mole. And to an error bar of 5 or 10 KKR per mole is too big because the barriers for the reaction are often of this, of this order here. So we have error bars that are the, of the order of the, of the reaction itself. And the reason for that is the excited states are always in a region of a high density of states. An excited state is never isolated, and it can cross. As soon as you make any small deformation in the geometry, you induce a cross to other states, and the electronic character of the, of the wave function changes. We don't have any method that can compute all the electronic characters at the same, you know, on the same foot, in the same level. And that's the main problem. If you take one surface, this the, the, the first excited state, and you make the, the analysis of the first excited state, you see that depending on the geometry, you can have different electronic structures. It can be a pi pi star, or a n pi star, or another kind of pi pi star. You can have many different surfaces there. And if you take a method like TDDFT, TDDFT, you make an excellent job for the local excitation, but you make a bad job for the charge transfer, and that you make create a 
imbalance, embarrassment in between the surfaces. If it takes Kaiser CF, Kaiser CF, you give a good result for the any pi star state, but Kaiser CF, you really give a very poor result for the pi pi, pi, pi star states, the ionic state. Again, I have it's, um, uh, um, it's not balanced enough. But I don't want to finish this with a negative note. If you understand what we're doing, and if you know uh, the, the, the simulations well, if you know your field, you can really find out the good method to compute the excitations, to compute the dynamics, and to get your results to compare to the experiments. You see this case here? That's chromium hexacarbonyl. And when you compare to the experiment, you get really an excellent degree of agreement, even within the, 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 the error bar. And even in the case that it, the agreement is not so good, we're really pretty sure that the problem is not the theory, but the problem is the experiment. At least we believe in that. Let me close this talk with a last topic, that the UV effects of, on prebiotic synthesis of nucleotides. This is one of the, uh, probably the most uh, advanced proposal for, for, for prebiotic, prebiotic synthesis of, of purine nucleotides. It starts from, from an environment of 4-HCN and ends up with a purine nucleotide like this. It was proposed by Sutherland in 2010, and you see that this reaction involves a, a, a photochemical step that's the transformation of this HCN oligomer into amidazole. And this photochemical step is known since the 60s. It was uh, uh, discovered by Ferris and, or and Orgel that showed that you can really go from HCN oligomer to amidazole using UV light. What nobody knew so far was how this photochemical step really happened. And then we went there, just step in this problem, and after a lot of work determining every intermediate in this reaction, we figure out that we had a map like this, that from this product you could go to the reactants through, first, this cis transisomerization, that was a trivial step, but after this trivial step, you have many possibilities. You had no idea which possibility was the best one. You have the barriers in the ground state and the barriers in excited states, but you don't know how much time or which one will be the favorite one. Dynamic simulation helped a lot because if you ask ourselves, is it possible to make the dynamics in a ground state? And then, if you check the dynamics in a ground state, you see that all the electronic energy is dissipated to the environment in the order of one picosecond. And using this information, and also information from the experiment, you can use chemical kinetics in the RRKM model to determine that the maximum time that the reaction can, 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 can happen in a ground state is 60 picoseconds. And for 60 picoseconds, the maximum energy barrier that you can cross is 30 kcal per mole. Now, if you go there and look again, you see that 50, 50, 74, 76, uh, 52, you don't have any barrier below 30 kcal per mole. And that tells, tells that this reaction can't help happen in a, ground, in a ground state. It has to be an excited state. And if it's an excited state, it's clear that this, you have 57, 57, 42, 66, 19. It's clear that it should be here. Extended this procedure over the whole pathway, we have been able to determine what was the reaction mechanism for, for this uh, cyclization. And this is the reaction mechanism that goes through this carbene here until get into, this, into the amidazole that could be this product or that product. I can summarize this in a more artistic way using this cycle here, starting for 4-HCN. You have a depolymerization, that's a thermal event. Then you have a photochemical event, that's the cis transisomerization. And then you go 
uh, we have another photochemical event that's a cyclization the formation of this four member, four member ring that opens the ring and forms a conic section. And at this point, it goes back to the ground state. And here in the ground state, two things can happen. You can either form amidazole, that's the final product, or go back to the ground state for memory ring that returns to this uh, intermediate. From the experimental data, you know that this cycle repeats some, uh, about 300 times, so it takes 300 photons in average until you get the amidazole being formed. But then you have uh, the final explanation of how this uh, reaction happens. And you can find the connection between the 4-HCN and the purine nucleotides using uh, the Sutherland pathway. Thank you.